you will, open your Bibles to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2. Uh, we step away from uh, uh, our exposition of Luke. We have uh, a five-part uh, series uh, planned in celebration of this, the Easter season, a uh, 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 series entitled, uh, The Person and Work of Christ, uh, that is, uh, in reality, what we would desire to proclaim most each and every Sunday. Uh, that is all we have to offer to you is the accomplishment of Jesus Christ, namely uh, His gospel, His saving work. But there's at least two seasons of the year, uh, the Christmas season and the Easter season, uh, that, that we uh, have a way, we have a means, and I think it's by God's design that we zero in on the reality uh, that that which is eternal, namely God, breaks into our time and space. At Christmas in the, in the, uh, in the incarnation that, that, that Jesus became a man, and He became a man for the purpose of accomplishing that which He would accomplish on that Good Friday, namely the atonement. And so we'll zero in on these things. Again, uh, beginning our series in the book of Acts, we'll begin in verse 22 of chapter 2 in just a moment. As I survey the, the cultural and sometimes the church landscape, I am perplexed and far too frequently perturbed by what I see, what I hear, um, there is a, an intense desire and even a, a formal movement to rewrite history. Now, for those of us in the church, there's really nothing new there in that there have been liberals in, quote-unquote, the church that have forever attempted to D deny the interface, the point of contact between the eternal God and historical realities. That is that we proclaim that in the incarnation, He who is and was eternal took on flesh for the sake of the accomplishment of the atonement. And so it's a, a great risk when we uh, decide to divorce the testimony of history from the reality of history. That, that is, we don't want that thinking to infuse the church because that which we proclaim and that which we celebrate, namely the gospel, was accomplished by a man on a cross in the course of history to which we give accurate and reliable testimony for the salvation of men. This Sunday is what the church has historically uh, identified as uh, Palm Sunday. We read Luke's account. Jesus, I believe in a very self-conscious way, appears in the city of Jerusalem. And by design, compels some disciples to go fetch for him a donkey. A good Jew couldn't mistake the symbolism. As that as David was facing his physical demise and as his son Adonijah was going to usurp the throne that was promised to Solomon, David instructs that Solomon could, should ride in on David's mule on his donkey that, that, that it would be seen that Solomon is indeed the inheritor of the anointing of God to rule over Israel that he was chosen by God himself not just by David but by God himself and he came as a king of peace now most of us know the reality there's a day that the Lord Jesus will one day reappear. 
He will present himself to the world once again. This time he presented himself on a donkey as a testimony to the reality that not only that he was a king, but he was a king of a kingdom of peace. That he came in peace. But there will be a day that he comes to make war. And he will come to make war upon all those who can persist in their rebellion against him and his gospel. And he will destroy them with the sharp sword of his mouth. And so today marks the beginning of what we sometimes call Holy Week. Again, a week in which the most unholy acts of men was carried out. We will come at the end of this week to what we often identify as Good Friday, the day that we remember the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ. But on Good Friday, very bad men carried out the most heinous of acts against the one who was the best of all men. He was the Holy One, the Son of God. That had come according to a plan that was designed by Almighty God and agreed to by all three persons in the Trinity that would be carried out in the course of time and space. And so let's begin our our thinking this morning with the the preaching of the Apostle Peter. I think that's as, as good as it can get. And so we will look at his announcement of that which Christ accomplished at Calvary for us. If you would, begin in verse 22 of Acts chapter 2. Men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh will also will dwell in hope. For you did not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will, you will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried in his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up. Of that we are all witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, He has poured out that this you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made Him both Lord and Christ this Jesus, whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized. And they were added that day about 3,000 souls. Pray with me. Father, once again, thank you for your truth. We thank you that we can trust it, that it is your faithful testimony to yourself, to your accomplishment. And God, that through the proclamation of this truth, you are still transforming us and you're saving others. We pray that 
you would work powerfully among us, that uh, we would speak truthfully, that your son Jesus would be glorified, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As we enter in to this uh, tremendous sermon by the Apostle Peter given on that day of Pentecost, the day that we can look at really, at least in some sense, as the uh, inauguration, the formation of the thing that we would call uh, the church as being something distinct uh, from the old covenant people of God. And so uh, Peter uh, does a bit of exposition appealing uh, to the Old Testament prophet Joel and says, now what Joel had uh, prophesied regarding what he saw off in the future has now been fulfilled in your midst that the Spirit of God has come and done a unique work among us. And then he's going to turn himself, uh, after explaining that phenomenon, he is going to give a, a, an explanation of what has occurred in this life and work of this one Jesus of Nazareth. And then he's going to turn himself to an explication of the meaning of the resurrection. And then finally to an exhortation. What shall we do having heard this truth? And so let's look, beginning back in verse 22, I call it the unmistakable attestation. Uh, Peter says, men of Israel. It's interesting there, bit of a, seems maybe a, of a, a bit of a rhetorical uh, advice, uh, kind of a, a pay attention, wake up. We see back in verse 14, he begins, men of Judea. And as maybe their attention have waned, men of Israel. And then in verse 29, brothers. And then in verse 36, let the house of Israel know. You need to pay attention. I'm making some crucial, life-giving, eternally valuable points here. So sit up, perk up, listen up. And so men of Israel, Jesus, this particular Jesus, you know the Jesus I'm talking about. He was from Nazareth. He was a carpenter's son. He was the son of Mary and Joseph. And he traveled throughout the region and that, that God so powerfully worked in him that you cannot deny that he is who he said he is and he is who we will say he is and he has done what we're going to claim he has done done. It is undeniable. It is irrefutable. It, 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 it's, 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 it's interesting when we speak of the reality of, of the gospel and of biblical truth. There, there is this undeniable aspect to it, that it is plain and that it, it is simple. But yet, Paul can question where the scholars of his age are as they consider the gospel to be foolishness as he expounds on the reality that the natural man the unregenerate man the man without the spirit of God he considers the these things of God to be foolishness they do not understand them because it is a requirement that the spirit of God work to give us understanding but he can also say in, a, in, in at least an interesting way to, to, to me in Romans 1 18 that Men have a certain knowledge of God for their conscience or creation, but most certainly in the gospel of Jesus Christ, they know their condition, they know what God has offered to them, they know what salvation is when they hear this gospel. It's not really hard to understand. But whether it's gospel revelation or what we call natural revelation, what do men do to it in their unregenerate natural state? They suppress it. Oh, I know it's true, but... I know it's true, but, 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 but God gets this. I'm a good person. I'm a good guy. But it's irrefutable what God has done. You cannot deny that God has revealed himself, and he has revealed himself powerfully, and it's unmistakable that Jesus is who he says he is, and he has done what he said he will do. Again, he really ends it up in that last phrase of, of uh, verse 22, as you yourselves know. You know it. You may not want to admit it, but you know it. And so, he makes this unmistakable attestation 
to the historical realities. Again, why is it so dangerous to rewrite and reinvent history? Because salvation is both rooted in that which is eternal, the will of Almighty God, and that which is historical, the accomplishment of Jesus Christ at the cross of Calvary. And so, let's look, beginning in verse 23, at what, what I'll call an unparalleled accomplishment. There's nothing else like it nowhere. Now, you English teachers ought to love that one. Ain't nothing else like it nowhere. That God, once and for all, uniquely has accomplished His will in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 23, Jesus was handed over. He was given over to these evil, wicked men for the purposes that suited Almighty God. Notice there in verse 23. Definite plan. Horizo boule are the two Greek words used there. That, that God, given due consideration in eternity past, in the councils of the eternal and holy trinity, both decreed and they determined by looking at how this decree was going to turn out that it was good and it was wise. Now please don't, un please don't hear me this way, folks. He did not look down the corridors of time and say, you know, I think that plan will work. He determined this plan will work, and we know it will work. We have eternal knowledge of everything from beginning to end, and this plan is good, and it's wise, and it will accomplish the thing that we desire to accomplish, namely the salvation of a fallen race, the salvation of wicked men. According to the prognosis, the, the predestined, foreknown, plan of God that, that this Jesus entered the realm, he was born by the ordained means, he was born at the appointed times, and he would go and accomplish the work that had been deemed to be that which he should accomplish for salvation of wicked men, and that plan had been laid before the world was ever created. I don't know how you could be more clear. And yet, in laying down this line of this is God's sovereign, unchangeable plan, there is no plan B, there never was a plan B, this is the way that I'm going to do it, there, there's no place for this, well, uh, God really wanted Jesus to come and claim that throne in Jerusalem, and yet the, the Israelites rebelled against him, and so God went to the cross as a secondary plan. Folks, let me tell you, it was not a fallback plan. It was the one and only plan for salvation from before the world was created. And so it was a definite plan rooted in the character and the will of God. And you murdered him. Now, we could write volumes. And men have as to how it is that God's unchanging and sovereign and holy plan could also involve wicked men who willingly, according to uh, their own devices, according to that, as, as you hear me say all the time, they did what they wanted to do, namely crucify the Lord Jesus Christ. But in their willing. Their willing was encompassed in the ultimate willing of Almighty God. That He would carry out what He willed through the evil acts of sinful men and they were justly accounted as guilty for their wickedness. I listened the other day and noted that the popular radio shows Rick, Rick Burgess was teaching a Bible study from a, a very popular book, uh, Knowing God, by J.I. Packer. I commend him. Maybe he should know that. Know that book. But I'd also like to commend him to another book by J.I. Packer. Evangelism and the Sovereignty of God. In which Packer uses a term, and this is your big word for today. Everybody get your pens and pencils out. Antinomy. Antinomy. And it's a word that Packer uses to describe things that 
to us seem irreconcilable and unfathomable and, and just we can't hardly get our, our minds around this. Uh, uh, you might even say paradoxical, but he backs off the concept of paradoxical and says a paradox is, is, is kind of a real contradiction. An antinomy is something that appears to be contradictory. Sovereign will of God, free will of man. He's saying they're not. They just appear that way, that, that this free will of man's choices are consumed in the greater will of Almighty God. It may not seem like it works together for us, but let me tell you something, in the mind of God, and that's where it's ultimate and that's where it's most important, these things work together. These evil men, as all evil men always have been and always will be, they are thoroughly and fully and justly in any court of law guilty for what they do. They have no excuse before Almighty God. That God would utilize them to accomplish uh, His plan is the prerogative of a perfectly and infinitely holy, almighty God. And so, you murdered Him. You're guilty. You need to own that. You guys listen to me. You killed God's Son. And then look at verse 24. God raised Him up. Now, if he hadn't already gotten under their skin enough, certainly you're guilty of killing someone that I'm proclaiming to you actually has the power over death. That is, the one that was placed in the tomb, the one that was taken off the cross, the one who was truly dead at your murderous hands, now lives. He now lives. And, and so God raised him up. And here's the thing. We agree about Joel, spirit descending. I've told you about that. Your scripture is indicting you. That's, you've said it's true. I'm saying it's right here and right now. Now get this. Your favorite king, David, spoke of the reality that this one you murdered was his greater son. You murdered him and God has raised him from the dead. David said, and this is a quote, if, you've got, if your Bible may have it set off in a different type of type or an inset. This is a quote from Psalm 16.8. David is saying, first of all, I saw the Lord always before me, for He is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Why can I live without fear in the midst of my enemies? David had his enemies. Go back and read the historical books of the Old Testament. He had his enemies. And so he understood this, that his Lord, his God, his good shepherd, was right beside him, always there to protect and defend. And so he goes on then, because of this, therefore, verse 26, therefore... My heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope. Because my God is ever beside me as my protector in the here and now. David said, applicable to us sitting right here in days that are sobering at best, despairing at worst, my heart was glad, my tongue rejoiced. We were standing around here yesterday after our, our work day. Bryce would have been very unhappy with us standing around Joey, just so you know, okay? You know, I, I figured that. But Joey shared with me. He pulled something out, so I want you to see this. A colleague, a co-worker, a very dear friend of Joey's, uh, passed away just a few weeks ago. The men that have been to... Uh, Joey's house for the fall barbecue and everything. You remember David who would sing and give testimony and so forth. David went home to be with the Lord a few weeks ago. And uh, he, he had no academic degrees in biblical studies or whatnot. And Joey showed me some notes that he, that he had made as he was dying. As he knew that, that, that outwardly this wasting away was going to bring about his death, that this cancer that had invaded his body would take him. 
And he began to write about his joy. And not only his joy, but that he could rejoice in the truth of the gospel, the truth of the work of Christ, the promise that cancer never, ever gets the final say, that death does not get the final say in the life of a believer. Those of you that have been around a while know that I have a pretty short fuse. One of the things that really gets under my skin. Well, that's just over my head. I don't understand. Listen. My dad always described himself as having a third grade education, and that's probably not too far from being wrong. But he understood the gospel. He understood his cancer was about to lay hold to his life. That his hope was not in anybody's, any doctor, any medicine. His hope, and he understood it. He understood it was in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. David understood, hey, doctors are great and good, but in the end, it is my God in whom I have placed hope. It is my Savior who in the day of my death is still at my right hand. And death does not defeat the believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. David said it. Both... 3,000 years ago and just the other day. Two different Davids. Just now caught that. But David believed that. And he lives, both of them, in the fulfillment of their hope. And so, David can say of him, verse 27, For you, my Lord, my God, will not abandon my soul to Hades. That, That death, the grave, does not have the final say. That, that, that the grave is not the end. And then he goes on and says what? This Lord that was at my right hand, that He is the Holy One, and you are not going to let Him see corruption. Now, I'm going to be placed on the gra- in the grave, and my body will be corrupted. Now, this is David speaking. This is Tim Evans speaking. My body will be placed in the grave one day, and worms will ultimately take their toll. My body will decay. But the Lord Jesus was placed in a tomb one day, and the way that His body was prevented from decaying was what? God raised Him from the dead. God gave to Him that glorified body that is immortal, that is beyond the corruption that is a part of the fallen realm. And so, David proclaims what? that his Lord, that, that, that this Holy One, namely Jesus Christ, would not see corruption. Men of Israel, men of Israel, your King David was talking about my Jesus. Do you understand that? And remember, you're the ones that killed him. But your killing him did not in any way stop the plan of God. In fact, it was a full part of the plan of God. That is the means through which he would accomplish his ultimate will. Verse 28. You have made known to me the paths of life, and you will make me full of gladness with your presence. Yes. That, yes, indeed, the gospel is the promise of the deliverance from the punishment, the just punishment for our sin. Is it just deliverance from hell itself? And certainly there is an ultimate gladness that will be just beyond our grasp in this realm. But let me tell you something. For the believer, there's a gladness right here and right now. That Jesus Christ, the crucified and resurrected One, is Lord. He rules and reigns. That that whatever the foolishness of men is in our world, the foolishness that crucified Jesus, the Spirit that was at work in them, is the same Spirit that's at work throughout the world now, that has been at work for the last 2,000 years, was at work for the four to 20,000 years before the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's always that spirit of rebellion, but it exists under the sovereignty of God, and all of these evil machinations of men are being woven together and will ultimately result in the return of our Lord Jesus Christ in which every knee will bow and every tongue will confess 
that Jesus is Lord. That does not mean that all men will be saved. But that means that all men will acknowledge that they have rebelled against a good and a gracious God and His offer of salvation. So, I know the way of eternal joy. I think that's something that, that maybe that's a, if you're like me, you can't memorize a whole lot, but you can probably remember, memorize six or seven words. That would be a good one. I know the way of eternal joy. I know the way of eternal joy. I know the source of eternal joy. I know the one who has accomplished for me eternal joy. I know the one who for the joy set before Him. Not the joy of the cross, but the joy of the accomplishment of the cross that God would save millions. That He would fulfill all of the promises in the accomplishment of His Son, Jesus Christ. Let's move to the third issue, beginning in verse 29. The undeniable assertion. Peter preaches, brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb was with us this day. I didn't know this until I was studying this week. That evidently, the tomb of David had become somewhat of a shrine. That it was a known place there in Jerusalem at, at, the, at the, this time. And that uh, several people had tried to grave rob it over the course of history. Ultimately, Herod tried to rob it. And Josephus, the Jewish historian, said that fire descended upon them and chased them out. So Herod thought better of it. Now that may be a bit apocryphal. I don't know if it is or not. Could be, could not be. But what Josephus says is there was a tremendous monument erected around the tomb of David. Now here's what Peter's saying. is what I'm saying to you is David's body was placed in the grave and it has remained there for this thousand years. It's there. In fact, if you really want to, we'll walk over there. And quite possibly we might even find his remains. It's there. And there's an unstated challenge here. Now go find the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Go to the tomb. We can take you there. It's a known location. Go to the tomb. Because the body's not there. This Jesus has been raised. There's a body in David's tomb, but there's not one in Jesus' tomb. That David's prophecy, which you guys are bound by, men of Israel, you're either going to be hung by your own rope or you're going to be saved because that rope becomes your lifeline. Right? You're either going to be hung by your rejection of this gospel or you'll be saved through your acceptance of this gospel. And so, Jesus was not abandoned. David saw it and he understood that his Lord, the one that protected him, his good shepherd, that he was going to come and that he was going to die, but he, that death would not keep its grip on him, that he would be raised from the dead. And Peter says there in verse 32, God raised him up and we witnessed it. We are the reliable and undeniable witnesses to the truth of the resurrection. We'll talk a little more about this next week uh, upon Easter. But that Jesus, look at verse 33, here's what's happening, or what has happened. Jesus crucified, He's buried, He's raised, He has now ascended, He is at the right hand of the Father, that is, He is now there for our intersection, He is there uh, for, for our protection, and He has poured out the Holy Spirit. He has lavished upon us with, with, uh, without, beyond all measure, He has poured out upon us and will con the, the, the Spirit will continuously be present and continuously working until the day of His return. Continually creating the church, the, the people of God. And so, Jesus did exactly what He said. They're, they're going to kill me. I'm going to be raised on the third day. Then I'm going to send the Spirit. Peter said that's what happened. Jesus has sent uh, the Spirit. And so, He is now, and once again, Peter appeals to a psalm, Psalm 110, that the Lord, Jesus, is now at the right hand awaiting the appropriate time for His climatic return to consummate, to 
put all the finishing touches on the plan of God, to perfect uh, that kingdom in its, in, it, in its final form. And so having presented all of this evidence, this Jesus, you know who he was. He was Jesus of Nazareth. Here's what happened, that you crucified him. You're guilty, this, but yet this was God's plan. And now because it was God's plan, God has raised him from the dead. This is what your scriptures that you say are true and reliable. This is what your scriptures uh, teach us. And so he makes what, is, what in verse 36 I call the unacceptable announcement. Again, one of those attention getters. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ. This Jesus whom you crucified. This man who shed blood you are guilty of. God himself has announced he is the promised one who is the descendant of David. He is the one. For some reason, that word house caught my attention this week in my reading. Partially because I ran across in the first few chapters of the book of Ezra, in my daily Bible reading. The Spirit of God stirred up the heart of a pagan king by the name of Cyrus of Persia to once again build the house of the Lord, to restore it in Jerusalem. And, and as the story goes, the, the, the temple is rebuilt, and, and there were some, upon its completion, they actually grieved because of its diminished glory. That, that it just wasn't what it once was as it was constructed in Solomon's days and utilized subsequent to Solomon's day. And the prophet Haggai came along in chapter 2 verse 9 and, and he sees their weeping and he says, let me tell you something. God is going to build a house and the glory of that house is going to surpass. It's going to be greater than the house you see. And let me tell you something, he wasn't talking about Herod's temple. I promise you that. It was great and glorious. It was a stupendous accomplishment architecturally. But what was he talking about? He was talking about a house that he had promised to King David. He said, I know you want to build me a house, and that's good and that's well, but you're not the one. Your son Solomon's going to build a house, but let me tell you what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to build, I'm going to establish a house for you and from you, and your descendant shall rule and reign over that house forever and ever and ever. This house of Israel, you need to take notice that this house that was promised to David, the, the mantle and the power and the revelation associated, associated with this kingdom of Israel is passing from you. Paul says that tongues was a sign to unbelieving Israel. Your day is over. Indeed, God is building a house, and it's called the church. What did Jesus say? I'll build my church. I'll build that house. I will build a greater house. A house not built by the hands of men. A, a temple glorious. A, a temple of the people of God. And the glory of these people saved by God's grace and for His glory, their glory shall surpass any, any temporal, physical, architectural structure. And so, house of Israel, know this. You've rejected the promised one, but again, you haven't thwarted the plan of God. That God is building His house. That Christ is building His church. And so the final thing this morning, unprecedented application. People heard this. Luke, in writing this, says that those who heard were cut to the heart. That means the Spirit of God so worked in them that they were ready to believe. That they were ready uh, to be saved. Now, we've, we've talked about when, when, when they asked the question, well, what do we do now? Well, Peter's response is repent and be baptized. And of course, that's been so misappropriated by certain groups over the course of years, I, and I don't have time to get into all of it. But just let me say it this way. Repentance is turning from sin. And let me, let me be sure you understand this. At least a part of the sin that the group that heard that day must repent of was their good works. 
that what they were believing was acceptable to God for salvation, their ethnic identity, uh, their, their participation in the rituals of uh, the temple, they thought of it as being sufficient for salvation. They had to repent of their good works. They had to turn from trusting in those things, turning from the sin of self-righteousness and turning to the Savior who is Jesus Christ, believing He is who He says He is, believing He did what He said He did, believing He will do what He said He will do, namely forgive my sins forever, giving me a home in heaven. Dead people don't turn around. Only those that have been made alive. Only those that have been cut to the heart. Only a heart of flesh can even know that it's been cut. If you follow what I'm say, saying. The heart of stone being replaced by the heart of flesh. When they, you have a heart of flesh, you turn from your good and your bad works. You turn from trusting in those and participating in those and you turn. And in turning, you are believing that what Christ did is sufficient and applicable for your salvation. And we're told that 3,000 were saved. It was a mighty work of God. And we see that a number of times in the book of Acts. That God worked in ways that we just cannot imagine. And Peter continued, save yourselves from this crooked generation. Don't let the mores, the standards, the the philosophy, the ideology, the doctrine, the theology of the current age to dictate to you what you believe and how you live. Seems like that's an applicable word for our day. Save yourself from the perverse notions being preached from both the pulpit and the political podiums throughout our world. Believe the truth of this gospel. That this Jesus, the Nazarene, He lived here, He taught here, He gave ample evidence, He demonstrated that He had God's approval upon Him. You killed Him. You're guilty. But then all along this was God's plan. To place Him on the cross to fulfill the prophecies that you've agreed are true. We all agree this is God's Word. Jesus is the fulfillment of the Word of God. And as Peter will say later in another discourse, He is the only name given among men by which men must be saved. He is the singular and exclusive. He is the only Savior. The one who died in our place. And God raised Him from the dead for our salvation. Paul, we'll be looking at next week in 1 Corinthians 15, speculates if Christ had not been raised. Says a few things, but what does he come back to? But indeed, but indeed, he has been raised. The gospel is true, and salvation is powerful enough for us to live with the fullness of joy in difficult days. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for the goodness of Your grace, for the reality and truth and power of Your Gospel. How I ask that You would work among us here today. We thank You that You give to us proof. Proof beyond any reasonable doubt that the Gospel is actually true. That You have done in Jesus Christ what You said You would do. And how we thank you for that. I pray that your truth would define our lives for our own well-being and for your glory. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.